Streaming now, this is the Wood TV Live Desk. And good afternoon, everyone. Phil Panarski here with the Wood TV Live Desk. Hope you're all having a great start to your Wednesday. And just like every Wednesday, digital reporter Matt Jarowski is here to talk about one of his latest pieces. And this one is particularly timely, not just because of the date, but because the Detroit Tigers are playing some pretty darn good baseball at this time. Matt actually take, took a look back at the 1912 incident involving Ty Cobb and the first ever player strike in Major League Baseball history. Matt, welcome back to the Live Desk. Hey, Phil. Good to talk to you. Yes, and I want to encourage everybody who hasn't gotten the chance to check out that story just yet. You can find it right now over on woodtv.com. If you're watching us on Facebook, you can just head on down to the comment section or in the description box, and you will find a link directly to that website article, and you will also be able to listen into this conversation while you're checking that out. But Matt, let's first address it. Let's go ahead and start off. The strike in started off in 1912 due yeah. to Ty Cobb being suspended indefinitely. What sort of led up to that suspension and ultimately this player strike? Yeah, so it's a, a pretty bizarre story. Baseball fans uh, know there, there have been plenty of strikes uh, in baseball, labor strikes. However, there's only ever been one instant where a team actually used strike, break, strike breakers or replacement players uh, to keep the game going, and that happened in 1912, and it was the Detroit Tigers. So uh, their superstar, Ty Cobb, he was 25 at the time, um, got, in, got into, we call it a fight. I don't know if there's much of a fight. He attacked <laughs> a fan um, when they were on the road in New York in uh, May 1912. Uh, the, the American League president, uh, Ban Johnson, just so happened to be there that day, uh, witnessed the attack firsthand, uh, and so Cobb was suspended. Uh, he was kicked out of the game and suspended indefinitely. Uh, so <laughs> how this all came about, Cobb is a pretty complicated figure in baseball circles. I believe there's really no argument about that. There's a lot of arguments as to why, um, but... About universally, he was pretty universally disliked. He was overly aggressive. He was uh, quick to fight, quick to argue. Didn't have a whole lot of friends in that regard. Um, and so the New York Highlanders, uh, before they were the Yankees, the New York Highlander fans uh, weren't big fans of Ty Cobb. Uh, so uh, before this game, I believe this was May 15th, uh, a, a fan in the crowd was uh, throwing uh, racial slurs and many other insults at, uh, at Cobb. And by the end of the third inning, he had had enough and went into the stands and uh, settled the score that way. Mm -hmm. Right. And going into the stands and fighting that fan there ultimately led up to him being suspended indefinitely. And that didn't sit well with the rest of Cobb's teammates as then they had to travel to Philadelphia to take on mm -hmm. the athletics. Uh, that game, uh, really, who took the field at the start of that game? But it wasn't the same team that really finished that game. No, not at all. So really what had happened, so the fifth, on the 15th, they wrapped up that series in New York. The 16th was a travel day. On uh, the 17th, uh, Cobb didn't play the game. He was replaced. Um, he, so he sat out the one game. Um, but at that point, his teammates had, had made it clear that we're not going to play unless Cobb can come back. Whether it was you know taking a stand against the insults and the things that this fan was saying, uh, to entice Cobb or to actually stand up with their teammate, even though most of them really didn't get along or like Cobb. Uh, <laughs> they were on his side in this matter. So on the 18th, uh, Cobb and his teammates took the field. The umpire waved Ty Cobb off, uh, and the rest of the team followed him off the field. Uh, now, before this game, when there were talks of potential player strike, uh, Ban Johnson made his point clear that uh, if the Tigers can't play that game, uh, they will be forced to forfeit, and that carries a five thousand dollar fine, which is that, that's major money uh, at this time of year. Mm -hmm. Ty Cobb is actually the only player on the Tigers team at that point that made more than five thousand uh, dollars in a in a season salary. So this is a big number. Uh, so the owner of the team, Frank Nabin, uh, was out ahead of this. He made a point. He went to his manager, Huey Jennings, and said, "Listen." If our players are going to strike, we need to have people ready to step in and play that game because I'm not paying this fine. Uh, so uh, the day before, uh, Frank Navin, Huey Jennings, worked with actually a local sports writer in Philadelphia to just put up some kind of tryout, find anyone they can bring in off the street to play this game. Uh, and they ended up bringing in uh, nine amateurs. There are seven, I guess, semi-pro or just 
baseball players, um, certainly not professional by any means. They brought in two people who were more known for being local boxers, and then Huey Jennings and then two other coaches who were retired players came out of retirement to play this game. So when, when the Tigers walked off the field, these strike breakers you know, were called in from, uh, from the bleachers, signed their quick one-day contracts, took the jerseys from the, the striking players, and took the field. Mm-hmm. And it, w- it was a pretty good show of solidarity between the teammates. I know you said that many of them maybe didn't like Cobb, but mm-hmm. you know, kind of banding together and really putting on a game to avoid that five thousand dollar fine is a good story in itself. But it really didn't end well for the Tigers as the uh, no. game took a very <laughs> harsh turn dramatically, as you would probably expect with replacement players. Yeah, not exactly competitive. I think it's interesting to point out too that we're talking about they were playing the Philadelphia Athletics. Mm-hmm. Uh, who are the, at this point the reigning World Series champs? This is no pushover. Right. So you're bringing in a, a squad of pick the worst time to right, really yeah. decide to do this. Uh, it's it's literally a pros versus Joes kind of argument yeah. here. Uh, the game was a 24 to two <laughs> loss. They lost 24 to two. A couple of just really bizarre stories to pull out of all of this. Um, the guy who who pitched the entire game, his name was Alan Travers. Uh, he's a Philadelphia kid. Um, he he said he'd never pitched a day in his life, but he impressed enough, pit the, the coaches enough in the tryout that they put him on the mound, and so he was paid $50, oh, wow. uh, which, I mean, that's a payday right. <laughs> back then. Uh, a lot of the players made like 10, 20 bucks, uh, but Travers got the most. Mm-hmm. Fun fact about Travers, that was his only major league game. Uh, he never pitched again, but he did go on to become a priest, uh, something that isn't uh, in the story, didn't really get too much into the weeds, but uh, he went on to become a, a Catholic priest or Jesuit priest, excuse me. Uh, and to this day, he's still the only priest to have actually played uh, in a major league game. Now to add, and I put this in the story, to add insult to injury, or injury to insult, excuse me. Right. Uh, <laughs> a player who played third base, uh, his name was Billy Maharg. Uh, he took a line drive to the face and lost a couple of teeth. So all in all, a rough day for Billy. <laughs> but Billy's story actually doesn't end in 1912. Uh, by 1916, uh, he worked with the Philadelphia, uh, with another Philadelphia team, uh, as an assistant trainer and a chauffeur, mm-hmm. and he actually pinch hit in the game in 1916. So he was the only strike breaker to actually come back and play another major league game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Mahark was also involved uh, with the Black Sox scandal. He was kind of part of that team trying to raise money to pay off the players mm-hmm. and uh, and fix the World Series. So. Just almost a bizarre multiple little connections there with just one random player. Right, and I, you could assume that with a story this complicated and with so many moving parts that there is some stuff that maybe hit the uh, chopping room floor. You weren't able to add it into the story at all. But, uh, Matt, you know, just what's just to kind of tie up a little bit of the loose ends involving in this story, what sort of happened next? After that 24-2 to two beat down, uh, what was sort of the next couple of phases that happened? Obviously, Ty yeah. Cobb. Uh, had to step in and say something to his team after that performance. So it was Cobb. He ca- he was the one who really kind of relented. Um, obviously, the players that that chose to strike along with him, they also uh, faced uh, fines. And Van Johnson even told them, like, look, if you keep this going, we'll ban you from baseball. You won't be able to play anymore. Mm-hmm. Period. Right. Um, and so Cobb was the one after that game came forward. It was like, look, guys, <laughs> uh, we, we can't keep doing this, A, because I don't want you guys uh, to, to face these heavy punishments, but mm-hmm. also uh, eventually I'm going to be allowed back to play, and I don't want my team's record to be in the gutter right. because we've been using these strike breakers this whole time. So he was the one who told his teammates, or at least convinced them anyway, we need to stop this. Mm-hmm. Um, he ended up being suspended for 10 games total, uh, and then before he came back, Cobb, had one of his many stellar years as a Detroit Tiger, mm-hmm. um, albeit this one wasn't. Uh, they finished, I want to say, sixth or seventh in the AL standings that year, so it's certainly not a, a mm-hmm. stellar shine uh, season at that point. Right, but ten games for fighting a fan, you know, seems kind of like a light punishment for that. So I'm sure he. This day and age, yeah, yeah. definitely would see a lot, a lot more. <laughs> definitely, and Matt, you know, as we mentioned, a lot to this story, a really great story. Again, I encourage everybody who hasn't had the chance to check it out. Go ahead and do so. It's live right now on woodtv.com. But, Matt, what was sort of your biggest takeaway from doing research in this story, learning about, learning more about it, hearing from uh, historians and just kind of what mm-hmm. they have to say about it? What was the one thing you really took away from the story? It's always just so interesting to learn some of the minutiae of these things. You know, when we think of 
the Detroit Tigers or any professional sports franchise, especially something like Major League Baseball, it's this big monolithic corporation. But to see, <laughs> to really come down to it, it's like, well, these guys had 24 hours to put together tryouts and just sign random scrubs off the street. It's just so bizarre to, to, to connect those two things. Um, so to, to, to see behind the scenes a little bit um, at, at how these things work, it's always just uh, really crazy. And again, I would encourage people to go read the story. There are lots mm-hmm. of certain details inside the story that, that uh, we didn't really touch on here, including uh, about the, uh, the man who started off, Claude Luker, who was the uh, fan of the stands in New York. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, you mentioned just how bizarre this story is, and it's very surprising that it's not hasn't already been made into a movie. I can already see it, how you know it's sort of like a heist movie. They're trying to put together a ragtag <laughs> team uh, to put on a baseball game. But, yeah, no, very interesting story. Again, as Matt said, I encourage everybody to go out and check it out. If you're watching us on Facebook, just head on down to the description box or in the comment section, and you'll find a link to that right now. And you'll also be able to hear this full conversation with Matt and I and be able to, again, get some additional information that was left out of the story. Matt, as always, thank you so much for being here on this Wednesday, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Anytime. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And I want to thank everybody else for tuning in to this latest edition of the Wood TV Live Desk. I'm Phil Panarski, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.